Okay. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to uh, today's uh, seminar. It's a great pleasure to have here uh, Dr. Gupta, whom I used to know as Professor Gupta when she was at the University of Washington. And uh, then she saw the uh, greener uh, lawn on the other side and went to Google. And uh, she is a, presently an, uh, running an R&D group at the Google Research and uh, designing efficient and transparent statistical learning and pattern recognition algorithms. Uh, in the, from 2003 and 2012, she was a professor of electrical engineering, as I just said, at the University of Washington, my alma mater as, as well. Uh, Maya also received the, the, her PKS award in 2007. PKS, for those of you who don't know, is basically the Young Presidential Award uh, with a little uh, feather on top of it when she gets it from the president himself, uh, George W. Bush. She also got an NR YIP award, which is the equivalent of the NSF, uh, in the 2007. She got her PhD in electrical engineering in 2003 from uh, Stanford in DE, uh, where she worked with uh, uh, Dr. Gray and Dr. Olson. For those of you, and some of you in my group certainly know of Dr. Olson, the majorization uh, theory book that we often use. And uh, she's also an NSF fellow. And uh, she holds also a BS in EE and Economics from Rice University, where uh, she graduated from in 1997. Uh, she worked at RICO California Research Center from 2000-2003, and uh, also uh, has held positions at AT&T, uh, Labs, uh, Microsoft, NATO, etc. <coughs> and she's also, well, I found out, actually a quite maybe a very promising and, and, and uh, upcoming uh, company that she's founded on artifact, artifact puzzles. So that's on her, that's her hobby. That's on her uh, sort of spare time. So without further ado, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce Dr. Gupta, telling us about some of the research in machine learning. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, uh, Hamid. <coughs> I'm going to talk today uh, about estimating means, and uh, let's maybe just start with some historical notes. I don't know if anyone knows kind of how, how long it's been that we've been taking averages. The first recorded uh, place where someone was taking an average that we could find was Tycho Brahe's work, where he was taking astronomical measurements, and he found that if he took the average of them, they would be less noisy and a little more useful. So that was the 16th century, um, just taking the average there. Uh, it was another 200 years before Legendre really formalized this and said that if we have some samples uh, here, like the green dots, and those are the yi's, and we want a new sample, mu hat, that's close to each of those yi's in the squared error sense, then the best thing we can do is the mean. Uh, so the, the mean minimizes the squared error to all the samples. So that really specifies in what way we're able to do noise this way. Okay. But um, the mean is really very robust in this sense. Um, and uh, Banerjee and Dillon in, in 2005 uh, showed that not only does the mean minimize the sum of squared errors, it minimizes the sum of any divergence if it's a Bregman divergence. And the Bregman divergence is just a larger class of divergences than squared error, includes relative entropy, eta kuro, saito distance, and some other distances. And then uh, Bella and I um, extended this uh, in 2008 to functional Bregman divergences to handle distributions and functions. But so the mean, a very robust sense of, of denoising here. <coughs> Uh, then again, the history of the mean, Fisher in 1922 with his sufficient statistics theory showed that you can't really do any better if you're calculating a statistic from the same sample, that you're not going to get any additional information from the mean. And this really sort of seemed to be the end of what we needed to study because this sort of says the mean is exactly what it is and there's not much more maybe to say. So it was really very surprising uh, when in the 50s Stein came up uh, with a new estimator um, and this has been referred to as Stein's paradox because it was, it was sort of so shocking and confusing at the time. And what Stein showed is if I have three different distributions and I want to estimate the means of all three of them, I like to get mu1, mu2, and mu3, and he assumed that those distributions were Gaussian, and I've got some samples from each of them, and these distributions are completely independent, so no statistical dependence or correlation at all, 
that I can do a better job of estimating this mean if I use samples from these other distributions. So, um, yeah, sampling from all of them is, is somehow helpful. So this, uh, again, sort of surprising because why should samples from these distributions help you do a better job here? Okay, so I'm going to walk you through the one sample case to give you some, some flavor of, of what Stein was really saying. So again, the problem is we're trying to estimate the means of T Gaussian random variables. They can be independent. Uh, and a random sample uh, drawn from a Gaussian, we're going to assume for the moment we know the standard deviation. And we're just going to assume we have one sample from each distribution. So if we just have one sample, then your maximum likelihood estimate for the mean is just that one sample you've seen. Sort of the best you can, you can do on a single task case. The James Stein estimate is that the teeth mean uh, should be that one sample, but multiplied by the shrinkage factor. And the shrinkage factor, you see here in the denominator, is uh, taking the samples from the t tasks all into account. And so you're, you're shrinking depending on how much the uh, samples you've seen from the other tasks. So how did he get this formula? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, terribly clear to people. Um, in the 70s, Efron and Morris uh, came up with an empirical Bayes argument that really sheds a lot of light on what's going on here. And they said, well, we can get that same formula if we think of it like this. Say that all of those different means, each mean is drawn from a Gaussian uh, with zero mean and some variance we don't know. So if a priori, and if you're familiar with hierarchical Bayes, it's also the hierarchical Bayes model, um, a priori, our means came from some distribution. So, and then each sample is coming from those individual Gaussians. So again, these individual Gaussians are still independent, but the means are coming from the same distribution. Um, then in order to get this James Stein estimate, you can note that given this model, the expectation for the mean given the sample uh, looks like this. It's the shrinkage of that sample you've seen. And here you don't know this because you've assumed you don't know that tau squared that the original means came from. But you do know that that quantity that you need uh, can be related to the data and expectation. So you only have this data thing, but an expectation is exactly what you want. So you'll just take the thing you have, plug it in, and that gets you the James Stein estimate. Okay, so that's sort of um, one argument and interpretation for, for a simple version. There was a lot of work in this area and some better estimates that were shown to dominate the original estimators. And uh, we'll be comparing to it's a box James Stein estimator. It's a positive heart estimator. It's sort of the, uh, as far as we can tell, the best you can do. Still making this assumption of Gaussians, but now hierarchically assuming that the Gaussians come from some distribution whose mean is really the pooled mean of the data that you've seen. So not assuming that your means a priori are drawn from, from a Gaussian of mean zero, but from, uh, from, a, mean, from a Gaussian with mean uh, based on the data itself. And this is that, that psi hat that just pulls the samples that you've seen. Uh, OK. So the thing that was so great about the James Stein estimator is that it really does dominate the sample average. Uh, you need to have more than three tasks, so more than three random variables. But then you can say that in a squared error sense, you're going to do better than just taking the separate sample averages. And one of the important things to note here is that it's not saying that every mean estimate will be better than the just taking the average, but that if you add them all up, the squared error of all your mean estimates will be better than the squared, total squared error of all the standard average estimates. So you might do a little worse on some means, but better on other ones. Um, but overall, you think you're doing a, a better job. Okay, so um, the James Stein work, as, as I just said, can be thought of as sort of uh, an empirical Bayes approach and sort of coming out of the history and approach of Thomas Bayes. What I'm going to show you today is a radically different approach to solving the same sort of problem. Um, that we'll call multitask averaging, and we're going to take a structural risk minimization approach, which is how we usually solve a lot of machine learning problems. And the structural risk minimization approach comes out of Vladimir Vapnik's work in the 70s, where he was sort of first proposing that when we want to make uh, predictions in machine learning, things like support vector machines, that we should minimize some loss and some regularizer. And so that's the approach we'll take today. So to do the structural risk minimization, we're going to set the problem up like an objective that we then want to optimize. Okay, so again, we're going to deal with this problem of estimating t means from t random variables, but we're going to relax our assumptions. We don't need to assume that anything's Gaussian. So as I'm showing here in my distributions, you know, they're not all Gaussian. This one isn't even continuous. I do need that the true mean and true uh, variance is finite, though. And you can have as many samples as you want from the different distributions, and here we can do something even if there's just two tasks. Okay, so the first thing we do to build this objective is just sort of start with, with the mean. So as we said from Legendre's work, you know that the single task means minimize the squared error. 
So that's all I've written here is that we can write the single tax means in the sort of as an objective function that would get us that solution. And when we have t different tasks, um, we can sum all of those t different tasks in our objective and we'll still get out the t means and this problem is completely separable still. Okay. Um, we're also going to divide by the variance of each of the tasks so that if one thing is measured in feet and one thing is measured in meters that we're sort of comparing apples to apples. So now we're looking at minimizing the Mahalanobis distance and this still, if you optimize this objective, would just give you the same single task averages that you always have. So things get interesting when we add the regularizer and that's where we start to have a real multitask problem. Um, so here we're now going to add this regularizer that says let me look over all t tasks and all other t tasks and try to force the mean estimate to be close. And we're going to be close in, in mean squared error sense. Yes? Can you assume the uh, We, like James Stein estimators, for the moment are going to assume the variance is known. In practice we're going to have to estimate that and we'll, we'll talk about that later. So yeah, so for the moment we're assuming this is known. So yeah, so the key idea here is that we're going to force the mean estimates to be closer together than they would have otherwise. And I've got this matrix ARS here that you can use to say how similar you think any two random variables should be a priori. Um, and that really opens up a big question of how do I know what ARS is? And we'll get back to that in a second too. Okay, so just like uh, other structural risk minimization problems, we're trying to choose our estimates or means to minimize this loss. The means should be close to the data we've actually seen and to be regularized. So no, this term doesn't involve any data at all. So it's really just lowering our estimation variance whereas this is lowering our estimation bias. Okay, so what kind of task one do we apply this to? Well, let's uh, get some intuition about, about why this works. Um, let's say I wanted to estimate the average uh, price of movies and the average mean age of kids at summer camp. Uh, how much does a movie cost around here? Ten bucks. I've got two samples at ten bucks. I need a third sample. Two dollars. You, you can go to the movies for two dollars? Yes. So we, have, we have outliers and noise apparently in this process. Okay. Um, so that he's only going to make my point clear. I think. Um, what about the mean age of kids at summer camp? How old are kids who go to summer camp? I've got a two. I've got a 14. And I've got an eight. Okay. So one thing you'll notice is that we could have, uh, that the true mean here and the true mean here are very close. So I could literally have used the samples from this task to estimate that mean and I wouldn't be too far off. A more extreme version of this is if I had two coins and I tried to bring two coins but I couldn't find any change. But if I had two coins and I took them out of my pocket, I could be flipping this one and if I flipped it ten times and tried to get the probability of heads, it would probably be a pretty good estimator for the probability of heads of this coin. Because the US government's pretty fair and they're probably both pretty close to 0.5, right? So it should be sort of intuitive that if the tasks really have the same true mean, that this regularizer of saying, well, this means estimate should be close to that means estimate, should, should help a little. Okay. What's a little less obvious is that this works, you don't have to, you know, it's a question, well, how close do these task means have to be? Well, this is still going to work even if the second task, the true mean is really quite different. And we'll sort of quantify and specify exactly uh, what we mean by the means having to be close. But that's sort of the intuition behind this. And here's just an example of, of what we're doing. So if I have those green samples from task one and the green samples from task two, my sample averages would be those red samples. And my new estimates, would be uh, both closer together than the sample averages because I forced the estimates to be closer together. Okay, so there's a lot of work that's been going on in multitask learning and machine learning and a lot of that work is based on much more complicated models um, or at the very least sort of linear regression models. Um, and so if I'm doing linear regression you're trying to estimate the slope for one task and the slope or the hyperparameter for another task. A lot of different machine learning regularizers uh, for multitask that have been proposed our work is closest uh, to the work by Sheldon and Caddo's uh, where they're trying to make the slope coefficients for one task close and pairwise to the slope coefficients for every other task. So very similar regularizer here. Um, and the main difference is that we're just looking at mean estimation rather than looking at complicated models. And part of why we did that is because we were interested in estimating means, but also because it means that the problem is so simple we can really start to analyze things. And multitask learning has been kind of like uh, very hopeful and very empirical and we wanted to say what, what can we theoretically really say about what's going on here and what we can do. So we'll show you some theoretical results in a bit. Okay, so this was that objective function again. I'm minimizing my errors and I'm forcing my means to be closer to each other. Because I've set everything up here in terms of squared error, I can get a closed form solution for this. So that's really handy and it's part of what makes it really easy to analyze this. So uh, what this says is that the vector of estimates 
is going to be some matrix multiplied by the sample averages. And this matrix, um, here is an indicator, and there's the covariance of the tasks and the number of tasks, and then L here is the graph Laplacian matrix. So if you're familiar with the graph Laplacian, that's great. If not, the thing you need to know is that it's a function of the matrix A, uh, L equals D minus A, and it sort of tells you how similar the tasks are and how you're pulling things together. Okay, so the first thing they ask when you see a matrix inverse is, does that matrix inverse even exist? And uh, yes, um, we have a nice lemma. It shows it basically exists uh, under all, all situations. And then the second thing to note is that these estimates that we're making are really just a linear multiplication. They're a matrix multiplication of the sample averages. So we're getting a linear combination of what you started out with as the sample averages. So that's easy to just see because it's a matrix multiplication. What's a little less intuitive is that, in fact, it's a convex combination. So we're promising that all of our estimates are just convex combinations of some of the original sample averages. And that shouldn't be too surprising because we pushed the means together. But in fact, it's kind of a pain in the, back, uh, pain in the butt to prove. Excuse me. Um, and uh, it means that you have to show this is a right stochastic matrix. Um, so that uh, there are similar solutions that come up in some other related work in, uh, in graph uh, machine learning. And this result generalizes some of, some of those results and uh, has a little tidier proof you can find in the paper. OK, so we noted that James Stein uh, dominates the sample task averages. Um, can we show this multitask averaging is ever better than just taking the sample mean? Uh, so we can do this for two tasks pretty well. So if I have some samples from this task and I have some samples from this task, I can take that closed form solution and I can really analytically do the matrix inverse and write out what the estimates are, and you see they are, in fact, some convex combination of each of the two means. And then we can analyze the, the squared error. And in analyzing the squared error, we can compare it to the squared error of just taking your sample averages and show that your risk, or your total squared error, is going to be better than the sample mean risk uh, if this inequality holds. And this inequality has two parts. The left-hand side says you want the left-hand side to be small, you want the right-hand side to be big. So on the left-hand side, you look at how close the means are. So if the true means are close, this is going to work better. And the closer the true means are, the more it's going to work. Well, close in what sense? Well, if we look at the right-hand side, you see it's got those task variances. So you want the means to be close compared to the task variances. So going back to the movie ticket problem, if all movies cost exactly 10 bucks, there's no variance to that distribution. It's always 10 bucks. But if movies vary from between 2 bucks and 20 bucks, there's a lot of variance. And then bringing in samples from a different task that's somewhat related can help a lot. The microphone part. Oh. Uh, <laughs> is that better? Yes, thank you. Let, let us know. Uh, the other thing you'll see on the right-hand side is this term 4 over A. And that A is telling us how much are we regularizing. So what this shows us, again, we want the right-hand side to be big. So if A was really, really tiny, then that right-hand side would be very big. And so that says as long as you use a small enough amount of regularization, this will always help. So you can always get a win as long as you're not too aggressive about how much you're trying to regularize. OK. And here we can see some of this pictorially. So here, for the simulation, I am going to assume Gaussians. So we've got uh, samples from task one, a standard normal. Samples from task two, a shifted standard normal. And I'm going to fix the amount of regularization at one, which isn't optimal, but just to fix it. And we're going to look at how much is, how, uh, how big is mean 2. So how much is this difference here? That corresponds to this right uh, x-axis here. And uh, we can see that when the means are close, so mu 2 is also close to 0, then we're getting gains of um, around 20% if we only have two samples from each task. And as you have more samples from each task, at 20 samples for each task, you're only getting a gain of around 5%. And that makes sense, because if you already have a lot of samples, you don't need to bring in samples from another task. And what was surprising to me about this is we thought, well, gee, your mean should be pretty close to make this work. But here, your standard deviation is 1, and you see that you're still getting wins compared to the, the sample average at 0. You're still getting wins out to around a mean shift of 1.5. So even though your means are more than a standard deviation apart, it's still helping to bring these samples together from these two different tasks. And as I said, this isn't really even the right uh, optimal amount of regularization. So if you brought that regularization down, you'd be able to shift that out a bit better. OK, so how should we set that amount of regularization? 
So again, we can go in and we can really analyze this and say what is really the optimal amount of regularization, the optimal task similarity to get the mean squared error as down as far as possible. And if we do, we see that that optimal amount of regularization is 2 over the difference of the mean squared. So that again tells us um, that the closer the means are, the harder we can regularize. And because we don't really know the true means, in practice we have to estimate this somehow. And so we'll estimate it by using the sample averages themselves. So we'll go, we'll get the sample averages, we'll use them to decide how much regularization to use, and then we'll recompute our estimates uh, based on those sample averages. Okay, and this sort of gives you some sense of the sensitivity to how much regularization you use. So this is that optimal amount of regularization, and as you change how much regularization you use. So when you have a smaller number of samples, a little more sensitive to getting that right, and as you have more samples, it sort of matters less uh, that you get that right, and so we can, do a, we can get away with just estimating it. Okay, so that was all for two tasks, because then we could really analyze that matrix inverse and say a lot. As you get up to more tasks, it's harder to analyze that matrix inverse, and we can't sort of say anything for generic T very well. So one solution, though, is we could say, well, we want to know how to estimate that, that task similarity matrix, or how similar any two tasks should be. What if we just take any two pairs of tasks, like maybe you want to know the price of bowling and the price of a movie, and we'll do that pairwise and do that pairwise, and we could just populate this T by T matrix by looking at each of those pairs. Okay, so we tried that, and it works, but it doesn't work great. And we found that a better solution would just be to constrain the task similarities to always be the same. So we're going to say that all tasks are equally similar, and now we just have to find one parameter to tell us how similar the tasks are. And this seems very unintuitive, because some tasks might be really similar, and some tasks might be not so similar, but it's going to work out better overall. And so if we do that, then we can actually analyze things again, because we've constrained this matrix so well that even with t-tasks, we can analyze that the optimal amount of similarity looks like the mean difference between the true means on a pairwise basis. So yeah, average square distance between the t-means. And again, we don't really know the true means because that's what we're trying to estimate. So we're going to have to approximate that with the sample averages. But it still gives us sort of a, an estimated optimal amount of regularization uh, to use from the beginning. OK, so I'm going to talk about three ways to set that task similarity matrix. I just talked about one where we really try to minimize the total squared error. We could also try to choose a to minimize the worst case total squared error. So we could say, look, we want to be more conservative than that and not regularize as hard. Let's make sure we don't screw things up. And then a third way that's very standard machine learning is to choose your regularization parameters by cross-validation. Um, and that's fine. It just takes a lot of data, and you have to, to futz around a little bit more to get, it, uh, to get a good solution. So I'm going to go um, over the minimax approach uh, fairly quickly just to give you a flavor for how that works. So in order to find the minimax A, how much regularization for a worst case scenario, I need to have some sense of the worst case scenario. And here I do have to make some assumptions. You need a constraint set for what your means might look like. So you get a, a box constraint set here, upper bounding and lower bounding, what the means could possibly be. And then you need a least favorable prior. And a least favorable prior over this uh, domain is going to be if, if half the probability is here and half the probability is here. That sort of makes the means as far about apart as possible. And again, far apart means are sort of the worst case for this kind of regularization strategy. And then if we look at the Bayes optimal estimator uh, with constant risk, with respect to this least favorable prior, we end up with a formula for the similarity again. And that formula looks like the upper bound, uh, the difference between the upper bound and the lower bound. So in practice, to use this, we have to make the guesses about what could our upper and lower bounds be for these means. And we do that by looking at the task sample averages and finding the upper and lower bound in the set. So if this was um, your sample average for task one, your sample average for task two, we would say, wow, we expect the true means to be somewhere between these two bounds. OK, so that'll generally um, give us less, uh, less regularization than uh, the constant MTA that we derived first. So I'm going to compare these things in simulation and on real data. So we have just a single task. Take your sample averages, just like you always do. We have Jane Stein estimation. Um, and we're using sort of the best James Stein, variant of James Stein we could, we could come up with. And uh, multitask averaging, again, has this closed form solution, but we need to choose how much regularization A. And we're going to either choose A to be 2 over these pairwise differences, that's going to be good on average, or uh, in this minimax sense. 
Okay. So we're going to start with some simulations, and the simulations were designed to be really random because we wanted something that would be sort of mimic reality, but be something that we could get statistical significance and just really pound away at. Yeah, so, so I, I just, I just going back. Uh, yeah. So that, that MTA that you got, that, that, that is very good look at your map estimator. Uh, this estimation here? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very, uh, very reminiscent of the map estimation. Um, you know, when, when you try to, to basically it takes a, take a Bayesian or a prior. Yeah. So the James Stein approach is a little, more, a little more obviously Bayesian. If we try to take a Bayesian outlook or Bayesian perspective on how we got this, we end up, um, we end up with a prior probability that's Gaussian on the differences between the means. Because if you look again uh, at the objective function, somewhere here, uh, at the objective function, we're penalizing the difference between the mean estimates in a squared error sense. So you can get this just like you can get ridge by assuming a priori uh, Gaussian uh, prior, or L1 by assuming a priori Laplacian prior. You can get this regularizer if you assume a priori Gaussian on these differences, but it won't, uh, it won't normalize. So it's an improper Gaussian regularizer on the differences. What's sigma? Uh, sigma here is the matrix of the task uh, variances. Okay. okay. And we'll, uh, let me, I'm glad you mentioned that because as we go into the simulations, uh, we should talk about how we do that. So in general, uh, we're going to use pooled estimates for all of the standard deviations. So instead of trying to estimate a standard deviation differently for each task, we're just going to estimate one pooled estimator for all the standard deviations. Uh, so we've got this Gaussian simulation where sort of everything is drawn Gaussian, and we've got sort of two to a hundred samples per task. And in the uniform simulation, sort of everything is drawn with uniform distributions, and again, we have sort of two to a hundred samples per task. Okay. And for the cross-validation, we're going to do a five-fold cross-validation. Um, and so we can start with the MTA formulas and just cross-validate how much regularization we use. We can also start with the James Stein formula which also tells us optimally how much estimation to use, how much regularization to use, but instead we can cross-validate it. So for James Stein, if we cross-validate it, all that looks like is your new estimate is some uh, convex combination of the sample averages and a convex combination of the pooled mean. So really that comparison is just saying, what if I just regularize towards the pool mean and I choose my regularization with cross-validation? That's the same thing as, as what we'll call here James Stein CV. And it's sort of, I think, the... Uh, first thing you might do if you were saying, oh, I want to bring these tasks together, is just try to regularize them towards the pool need. Okay, so I'm going to go through uh, some simulations just real quickly. This is with five tasks, um, and some of the things to note is uh, the MTA constant, which is sort of our, our main proposal here, and the dark blue line. Everything's being compared to the single task averages, which is at zero. And you're just seeing how much are you gaining. So you'd like to be gaining more, you'd like to be down further. <laughs> And here we see the James Stein in cyan, uh, nicely gaining all the time, uh, but not as much as, as the dark blue line. And this is the variance of the means, so it's a similar to how much are the means shifted, just how much are the means shifted probabilistically, or on, on average in a sense. Um, let's see here. So this is five uh, tasks, 25 tasks, and out to 500 tasks. And the more tasks you bring together, the, little, you know, the better performance you tend to get because you have a lot more data to, to work with to try to make this work. And one of the things you'll see is that uh, even as the means are really, really far apart, three standard deviations apart, uh, everything's still doing slightly better and not necessarily worse than just taking your single task estimate. So pretty robust in that sense. You'll also see the MTA constant here doing better than the cross-validated versions. So the fact that we're estimating how much regularization to use is in fact working. And with James Stein here in the cyan, the cross-validated version is the dotted line here. So there the cross-validation is actually doing better than the optimal estimate of how much regularization to use. When we go to uniform simulations, things are mostly the same, except you'll notice that a bunch of these lines are now popping up and getting worse than the standard, uh, standard single-task averages. So now if the means are too far separated, you might do worse. And in particular, the cross-validations tend to do worse and even the MTA constant that we're proposing starts to do worse uh, if you're too far away uh, for your means. Whereas the James Stein never did super well, but it also tends not to do uh, worse, so that's nice. Okay, and 25 tasks, and after 500 tasks, everything gets smoother, everything gets a little safer. Um, 
and your gains are up to around 40% here that you might possibly get. So really kind of a lot of gains are possible by bringing this information together. Okay, so that's simulated data, but what about real life? Uh, I work for a company, uh, Google, and they don't sell simulated products, so we need to be able to handle real data. So let's see what happens uh, with real data. We're going to start, though, with just sort of a silly example, which is estimating class grades. So let's say that we took your grades, your homework grades, and then we wanted to estimate your final grade. So the model here is that your final grade is sort of the expected grade that you should get and that your homeworks are literally IID samples from that distribution. So it's not clear that the model is really very good. Um, and we had, uh, oh, this is my, my co-author, Sergi, there in fourth grade. Um, so we got 20 different uh, classrooms, uh, different professors to give us their grades from their classes, their homework, and their final grades so we can get some data sets. So we have 22 separate data sets here that we looked at. And for each data set, the students are the multiple tasks. So if we've got 50 students, we're regularizing those 50 students together. Okay, and again, we're using pooled variance to estimate the variances uh, in all cases. Okay. So here again, the numbers are going to be the percent decrease, so percent improvement in squared error compared to just taking the standard means. And the first thing we see as good news is that the pooled mean, if you just said, I'm going to replace your grade with the pooled mean of everyone's grade in that class, is 77.4% worse. So that's good, you are individuals, it's nice to know that. Um, and if we do James Stein, we do get a, a win of around 15%. So we can do better uh, with James Stein than just uh, taking the averages. So you guys are a little more correlated, um, or sorry, I shouldn't use the word correlation here, but regularizing the grades together, the students together, does help a little bit. And with the MTA constant, we see a 16.6. .6. So this is about a 10% gain over James Stein. Uh, but what's really nice here is that it's a big gain over, over sample averages, big gain over treating these things individually. Okay, if we look again at these sort of optimal estimators versus cross-validating how much regularization to use, we see that it does help to just use the optimal. It's also super fast. Cross-validating uh, takes a lot longer to do. And uh, the same thing with the proposed uh, multitask averaging. Better to just use our estimated amount of regularization than to try to cross-validate it. And then uh, we talked about that minimax approach that says, let me choose a smaller amount of regularization where I don't think I'm going to screw anything up. And that's still giving you a small gain here, 2.7% gain. But if we look on this row at the standard deviation of those gains over those 22 different data sets, we see the standard deviation is very small. That is, this minimax estimator is always giving you an improvement. Not just a big improvement on average, but always giving you a little improvement. Um, whereas the MTA constant, much higher variance. Uh, so sometimes you get big gains, sometimes you get smaller gains. Okay, so uh, a little bit more of an industrial, uh, real-world example uh, is estimating Amazon customer reviews. So let's say we have some products. Um, in fact, we might have blue suede shoes as a, a product category that we're looking at. And we might have three products in this category, three different types of blue suede shoes. And this one's been uh, rated a few times. Four different people have come and given us reviews. This one's been rated three times. And this one, we've only seen one rating. One customer came, you know, the shoes rubbed wrong. They gave it a one-star review. So if we just treat the quality of each of these products by averaging the customer reviews, we'll get very poor reviews here and, you know, better reviews here. But this is really the kind of problem where this should help because um, we don't expect, uh, we expect this to be sort of a high-variance piece of data, right? It's sort of unlikely that the truth is that this guy really only has one star. From a one to five star range, that's really the, the end spectrum of even the possible bounds of what that review could be. So this seems like a nice problem where maybe we can bring this data together and do a better job of predicting future customer reviews. So we do this in a leave one out cross-validation setting. So we leave one out, we form our estimators, we see how we did on that one review left out, and we iterate through all the possible reviews. Um, and we looked at four different products. Uh, machine learning books, uh, blue suede shoes, espresso machines, and robotic vacuums. And uh, let's see here, there's fewest blue suede shoes, there's only 37 products there, a lot of espresso machines, 277 different espresso machines that we pulled data for. Um, and the number of samples is the number of reviews, and so some products only had like two reviews, and some espresso machines, uh, people were very passionate about the coffee, uh, 1,788 reviews on one of those espresso machines. Um, and here's just how many reviews you have on average, so differing uh, aspects there as well. Okay, so how do we do? Well, on machine learning books, um, 
I didn't highlight this, but I, I think this is, is interesting. If we just use the pooled mean, so instead of looking at each machine learning book individually, we just look at them all and say, you want to know how good a machine learning book is, let's just give it the pooled mean estimate. Uh, that improves over the single task estimates by about 20, 25% here. Uh, so that's um, concerning for what a good job we as a community are doing reviewing our machine learning books. So we might want to take that into account. Okay, the MTA constant also picks that up. Uh, James Stein, in this case, slightly worse, but, but fairly comparable in how it's doing. Uh, with the blue suede shoes, we're seeing, uh, you know, 12% gains. Uh, with the espresso machines, here we're seeing a little bit bigger difference here, uh, sort of picking up an 8% win with the MTA and only a 4% win with the James Stein. Robot vacuums, harder to, uh, to predict, uh, 2.5, uh, 0.7 gains. And then if we take all the products together and say, look, these are all just products. Let's not treat them as separate categories. Let's put all those together and treat them as one huge multitask problem. We do still make very good gains. And that gets back to this point uh, that I really want to make, that in multitask learning, it isn't that the tasks have to be semantically similar. There isn't that much similarity between shoes and espresso machines. And yet, if they're statistically similar, uh, we can still do a good job of throwing them all together and using multitask regularizers to do a good job. Okay, so on average, we do see um, a fair gain over using the multitask. Uh, this is now averaged over the, the product experiments here of using the multitask averaging uh, versus using the James Stein. And both of them are doing a lot better than just saying, you know, using the, the pooled mean. We also uh, consistently see that the cost validation is not doing quite as well. Um, so using the optimal estimation formulas do seem to work better. Similarly for the multitask averaging, uh, you know, you do very well with cost validation but again, a little better with our estimate for how much regularization to use. And then again, with the minimax, you get a lot less gain, but the standard deviation is very tiny. So if you're feeling conservative or your boss doesn't want to try something so risky and new, this is a nice way to say, well, let's just, let's just improve things a little. It's going to work fine. Don't worry. Okay, so we already talked about how uh, you can put everything together and still do quite well. Um, I'm going to talk about one last application which is estimating product sales. So here, um, as, as Hamid mentioned, I have a, a jigsaw puzzle business. And the nice thing about having your own business is that you can get all the data you want. So no, no restrictions on uh, what kind of data we can get. So uh, we looked at how much will the teeth customer spend on their next order. So we're going to look at, um, we looked at some fixed time span, and we pulled the repeat customers from that time span. So there was uh, about 1,355 repeat customers in that span. And uh, our product is actually fairly expensive. Um, and some people are very uh, excited about jigsaw puzzles. So one customer on an order might spend as little as $9, uh, but they might spend as much as $2,403. So a huge range here of the samples. And as we sort of expected, there would be a huge range of what customers were really doing. But really, these are just very high variants. So a customer might spend 60 bucks on one order and 300 bucks on another. So this is kind of a good application for this, where we know if things are higher variants, that we expect to get more value out of this multitask uh, learning. And for the different customers, these were all customers who had repeated at least once, so they made at least two orders, and uh, one of them had made as many as 23 orders. Okay, so how do we do? Um, so again, here the pool mean does a little better. James Stein giving us 21% gain over treating these customers independently, and the MTA constant giving us a little more gain over that at 22.4%. So again, what was shocking here is how much better you can do by bringing these tasks together than by just calculating these, these sample averages separately. Okay, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about big data. And I'm not going to present any data, but um, we're just going to sort of walk through some of the possibilities here. So let's say, for example, uh, that you worked at Google and you were interested in estimating the click-through rate, um, UT, for the Teeth YouTube video. Okay, so how many YouTube videos how many videos are there on YouTube? Any guesses? Okay, so the, the public number is at somewhere around a billion. So a billion with a B, okay? So now our multitask problem is we want to make a billion estimates at once. Okay, and for each of those uh, billion videos, for each video, we've seen some sample impressions. So by click-through rate, I mean you may be searched for cute puppy dog, and we presented you a video, and you either clicked on it or you didn't. So, so many sample impressions, and of those sample impressions, the samples are either you clicked or you didn't, and we get this average would be our expected click-through rate. Okay, so what can we do here? This is kind of a, a big problem. Well, um, one strategy we can use is to use that closed-form solution 
And using the Sherman uh, Morrison Woodbury formula, you can compute that matrix inverse fairly efficiently. Um, but once you have that matrix inverse, you're going to take a, each estimate as a convex combination of all other sample averages, right? So you have a T by T matrix multiply. So it's a billion by a billion. So that's going to be painful. But you can do it. And there's some, some interesting research out there about how to do that efficiently, maybe with some randomized structure or something. So certainly this is one of the approaches that you can do is try to compute that inverse matrix and try to apply it and, and do that all as one big linear uh, matrix multiplication. Um, a different strategy is that we can try to break those tasks into separate clusters, either with a soft clustering or a hard clustering. So just like in the Amazon customer reviews, we saw that we could take all the products all at once, and that worked well, but we could also just take our robotic vacuums and our espresso machines, and maybe we can somehow summarily separate this huge data into chunks that we believe maybe are statistically similar based on some cognitive similarity or semantic similarity. And again, semantic similarity not perfectly correlated with statistical similarity, which is what you really need, but probably pretty useful still. Okay. And then a third strategy um, would be to go back to that objective and try to optimize that objective with stochastic gradient descent. And so I'm going to spend a, a slide or two talking about that. So what do I mean by that? So uh, if you remember, we had this objective, and we said, hey, our estimates, we want our estimates to be close to the data, that loss, and we want our estimates to each be closer to each other, that regularizer. And because it was squared error, we got lucky. We had a closed form solution, and all the data I've shown you has been using that closed form solution. But I didn't have to take that closed form solution. I could just try to optimize this objective function for my means uh, directly. So I might start with some initial guess of the means, and I might use gradient descent to sort of hill climb and get to the bottom of that objective. Okay, so I'm assuming that everyone's familiar with, uh, with gradient descent. So the problem with gradient descent in when you have really large scale data is that to take the gradient of this objective, I'm summing over all billion videos and all samples, uh, sample impressions of those billion videos. So I now have to sum over something on the order of trillions in order to get one gradient calculation. So this is going to make my gradient descent really kind of painful. <laughs> um, so the way we usually solve this in, in large-scale machine learning, um, this is sort of the most standard technique you'll see, is with stochastic gradient descent. And in stochastic gradient descent, we're just going to sample one sample randomly. So one of these YTIs, one person telling us that a movie ticket costs 10 bucks. We'll just take that one piece of data and take the gradient base just on that one piece of data. So, you know, I had a gradient of a sum, but I can think of that as a sum of gradients. So I can just take that one gradient, and I'll take a tiny step just along that gradient. And we'll talk about a really tiny step, just, just a little step. Okay, so as you do that, you're going to get this set of random gradients, and you'll notice they don't all head downhill, because while the gradient of the full thing heads downhill, my stochastic gradients are kind of random. So when I get down to the bottom, in a nice proper gradient descent, you'll just sort of arrive, and you can smoothly come in and your gradients will go to zero. But with stochastic gradient descent, you can't promise that. So even when you get right to the optimum, you might still be fishing around a little bit as you draw these more samples. Yes? If you go out there with a step sample, you have Oh, I didn't hear you very well. I mean, if you, uh, but this is stochastic gradient descent. If you go up, up here, how will you up that step, that step, that step, that step, that step, that step? Ah, so you might go uphill. The thing is, you don't know if you're going uphill or not, right? You just, you've drawn this one random sample, you took a gradient step. Yeah, so to calculate that cost function, we're going to have to evaluate some huge thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, look, we know these stochastic gradients and expectation are going to do the right thing. So we'll just wait long enough and we know that everything's going to work out on average. And yes, sometimes we're going to maybe take some small s steps uphill, but it'll be okay. We'll just wait, and on average, we know everything's going to work out. Um, and then the point I was getting to, though, is that even when you reach the minimum, you're still sort of taking these small steps, and you have a hard time knowing that you're at the minimum. So if you talk to numerical optimizers, they'll often complain that stochastic gradient descent is not an ideal algorithm because it's very hard to get very precise solutions. It's really hard to really, truly, truly minimize this thing to 10 to the negative 12 precision. But if you're dealing with industrial-sized data, you often don't need 10 to the negative 12 precision you would rather have a pretty good solution, a 10 to the negative 6 solution, fast, rather than having a 10 to the negative 12 solution a lot slower. So this, of course, depends on what you're optimizing and what, what the right algorithm is. But for many uh, practical machine learning uh, algorithms or large scale, uh, stochastic gradient descent really should be your first baseline um, for what you're looking at. OK, so um, 
standard stochastic gradient descent will tell us how to deal with the fact that we have too many samples. Um, normally, we would have a regularizer that was per parameter, like ridge regularization. But here we have a regularizer that's pairwise on our parameters. And so now this sum is also going to be like a, a billion by billion pairs of parameters that we're trying to regularize. So um, in our work, we started also applying stochastic gradient descent to these graph regularizers. And so what we'll do is we'll draw two tasks randomly, that is two of those means, and we'll just calculate the gradient for those two tasks at once, and we'll take a little tiny step on there. So there's some, uh, there's some, some theoretical work we'd like to nail down better about how these two kinds of stochastic gradients uh, need to work together, but basically this works pretty well and lets you handle uh, really large-scale data. Okay. Um, so I do want to make a few more comments. I'm okay for time, right? Yes. A few more comments about big data from, from Google's perspective and really more from, from a general industrial perspective. And this isn't necessarily representative of all big data problems because in academia, um, you're often dealing with very scientific problems um, and with a variety of problems that, that's bigger than the kind of problems uh, we see at, a, at an internet company. But I think it's good for you to just hear uh, what, what kind of perspective we have. And uh, I was recently on a grant panel where the goal of the grant was to look at big data uh, grants and um, there, was, there was certainly a difference in opinion uh, from the academics and what they were necessarily thinking of big and from what a company like Google thinks of as big and that difference was around five orders of magnitude. So that's why I'm bringing it up. <laughs> um, and so, so in that sense it's, it's bigger than you think and not you personally but just bigger than, than you might think in general. Um, so to be a little more specific uh, if you're dealing with something like samples, um, then you, you want to be talking about at least a million samples. And really, you want to start to think about, if you're doing research in big data, designing algorithms that work not for a million samples or a billion samples, but what happens if I have literally infinite samples? You know, can I make this algorithm work, or what approach would I try? And uh, again, this sort of gets back to this thing where we're showing that gradient descent, which is a, a great way to do things, if you have way too many samples, starts to become really problematic even something that's O of N then becomes really problematic. And uh, we love sublinear algorithms. That's great. Um, but it's very hard to develop sublinear algorithms. Linear algorithms, also quite good. Um, N log N algorithms, also very good. But if you're getting slower than N log N, then you're going to have a really hard time in practice applying that to uh, big data. So that's Roughly speaking, of course, this is all application dependent and sometimes you can't do that well, but just the stake in the ground, if you're talking about something that's fast, you want to be talking about something that's n log n and not something that's n squared or n cubed. Um, so another uh, big issue we see with uh, big data is that you're going to need to parallelize it because it's not going to fit on one machine and because you want things to run faster. So one of the things sometimes uh, I see is people will come with sequential proposals. So an example of this is if you're trying to solve an optimization problem and you say, hey, I've got two-phase process. In phase one, I'm going to find a really good initial condition. And in phase two, I can then parallelize it and actually optimize. But if phase one, finding a really good initial condition, takes you 10 minutes, and if I can just parallelize well and I can be done in five minutes, then you sort of set yourself up for the sequence of, of events that you, you, uh, is going to slow you down. So if you can be parallelizing things and maybe randomly finding an initial condition or something, uh, that may in fact be a lot faster than having to do something that, that requires two steps. And again, this depends on the hardware architecture you're using and how much parallelization you can get. A lot of times, if you're just parallelizing on one machine, maybe you've got four cores, six cores, 10 cores, 30 cores. Um, that's not the kind of parallelization I'm necessarily talking about. That's great, and, and you should do that. But you also want to be thinking, how do I parallelize on 1,000 machines, or 10,000 machines, or even more? And there, um, you know, you can just win so much by, by having good parallelization. But if you're going to that kind of really highly parallelized environment, uh, you have to be aware that all 1,000 machines are not going to finish at the same time. So you don't get a 1,000 times speed up. Uh, some of your machine workers will be fast, and some of them will be slow. Some of them, in fact, may just die on you. And again, this is going to depend on your architecture and what your cluster looks like. But you know, something to keep in mind as you design those, those highly parallelized algorithms is that you want to design in for the fact that you're going to have faster or slower workers. OK. Um, this is, in fact, my last slide. Um, so just to, to summarize here, I told you about multitask averaging. Um, we're hitting that same issue that James Stein was about bringing together uh, different tasks and samples from different tasks to do a better job of averaging. 
Uh, for us, this is a more intuitive approach to set it up in a machine learning type framework where we have this regularizer and we have pairwise regularizers. We could extend this to different uh, loss functions and do some implicit clustering. There's sort of a lot that you could uh, extend there because it's easy to see what we're, what we're doing. And we showed real world gains over just taking the sample task averages of 2 to 25 percent. So you really can gain a lot by this approach. In terms of comparison to James Stein, we generally do see gains uh, compared to the James Stein estimation, um, but the gains are smaller, maybe 2 to 10, maybe 2 to 15 percent, uh, because the James Stein estimation is already getting you a lot of good value there. And also, we do generally see gains compared to cross-validating the regularizer, because part of what we've done here is shown how to optimally estimate that regularizer. Um, and uh, while it's called Stein's paradox, it's really not that paradoxical. All that's happening is regularization. Anytime you're estimating something and you stop listening to your data and start to listen to uh, fire assumptions or stakes in the ground like ridge regularizer where you're regularizing towards zero, uh, you've got regularization happening and it lowers your estimation variance and you can do a slightly better job. So some of the key open questions here is uh, a lot of more complicated algorithms or even simple algorithms really estimate multiple means as a component of what they're doing. And so uh, are there algorithms where we can uh, use multitask averaging to do a better job in the overall algorithm? And uh, we presented some analysis. We really had to simplify our multitask learning back to just estimating means. And a lot of our analysis is just for two tasks. Uh, but it may be that you come with some new ideas. If you take a look, you can see how to generalize that analysis to, to more complicated problems. And then uh, we forced all of our task similarities to be the same. And we showed that we could optimally estimate that. But that's probably not the best thing to do. And in fact, we know that if you had a better task similarity matrix, you'd do a lot better even. So we think there's probably a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of improvements that can be made here in how you estimate the task similarity matrix. Uh, if you'd like to, to learn more, this is coming out in the Journal of Machine Learning Research in a month or so. And you can find a preprint uh, on my website or on the Google Research site. OK, uh, thank you. Any questions? Yes, Harry. So uh, I'm wondering if you add simulated data to the real value data, does that improve the estimate of the real world data? So um, to some extent it can. And a way to think about why that works is ridge regularization. Right? So what is ridge regularization? You're pretending that your, your parameter should be closer to zero than it should really. And so to the extent that that works, you also can get away with like adding simulated data. So now, a lot of these uh, results about lowering the mean squared error are good in the total mean squared error sense. So if you're trying to estimate 500 means, you're going to get better overall. We, don't, we can't uh, promise as well that you'll get better on every one. In the two task case, you do get better on every single mean. But in general, and also with James Stein, you're getting better overall. So if 499 of those tasks are dummy tasks, then that doesn't really help you much. But so, so the answer to your question is yes, but not so much, but a little. Another curious question would be, if you increase the number of tasks, overall, will you do better? Or uh, is there a you know, point where you'll stop doing better? Um, in general, we found uh, that you generally do better. Um, that's based on the simulations, uh, where you can see at 500 tasks, <laughs> you can see all these lines are down. The blue line is here down around uh, minus 45. And even when the means are really far apart, you're seeing around uh, 5 or 10% gains. Um, but at five tasks, this is down around 35, and that's down around more like 3%. So to the extent that we've looked at it, it does seem like it does help more. But I think you're going to get sort of uh, less and less value out of that. And I don't have a good mathematical analysis of that. Uh, I would love to see that, though. Uh, I was wondering if your formulation is only for uh, scalar averages, I mean means, or it could be also extended to like multidimensional, I mean higher order averages. Yeah, uh, vector averages are a really easy extension, in part because everything we looked at here was squared error, and so everything sort of uh, becomes very separable. But as you, um, and you can take into account covariance matrices as well. Uh, for things that are more complicated than just vectors, um, like if you're trying to estimate multiple matrices, uh, I'm not sure you'd have, to, you'd have to look at it. And if you change the loss function to squared error, it also become less obvious. And do they need to be in the same dimensions I mean, for different tests, or they could be like with different dimensions? Uh, I think again that would depend on how you set up the loss function. So if you were like, this is two dimensions, this is three dimensions, but I'm going to look at all pairwise squared error losses, 
it's not a big deal, but if you start to think more about the loss between a 2D vector and a 3D vector, I'm sure maybe there's a better way to, to look at that loss. And also, uh, what's the complexity of your algorithm for like the calculation of the uh, constant of the MTA? Um, the calculation of the constant MTA. So uh, you need to be able to calculate this estimated amount of regularization, and that's based on the average pairwise difference between your sample averages. So you first have to calculate your sample averages, um, and then this pairwise thing, uh, if you're doing an all task, is going to be t squared. So that's going to be sad uh, if you have a large T. Um, in practice, you may want to uh, randomly sample that because, as we saw, there's quite a lot of robustness to that amount of regularizer. So I don't think if you had large T, I probably wouldn't bother to like actually look at all pairs in order to estimate that. Yes, Jen. Um, why is it that you're able to handle the T equals the two case, whereas the J sign requires the T greater than Let's see there. Um, it's a good question. It has to do with the degrees of freedom. And I'm going to refer to you a paper where we, we mentioned, because there's a t minus 3 that comes up in the formula. And it comes there for good reason. But I don't remember all the details. The James Fine was guaranteed. It's basically theoretically guaranteed to work on the t But yeah. I think there was a guarantee. It was basically a theoretical issue. Seems like another big benefit. Right. For us, yeah. Although, again, you wish you had more tasks because you you do better. Yeah. Yes. Um, there is a slide about the cross validation. So, I, I think when the uh, when two when two tasks are really uh, close, the error would be big. Is that because when uh, because you are doing the uh, both me and the two types are kind of separate, and then you get that cross validation. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. So we're talking about the cross validation, and if two, um, if two things are close, then the error of the cross validation will be there. And then uh, how? how um, the error of the cross validation. So the cross validation is just going to decide how much regularization to use, and so if two things are close. In general, you will end up using more of the regularization because you do a good job of sharing the samples. Um, Why don't we talk offline to that? I don't feel like I answered your question. I have one last question. Um, yeah, very good. Okay. So, you know, you mentioned that sort of intuitively when they're statistically similar, there's a gain. What's the, is there a formulation for statistically similar? Like what? Uh, we don't have any distribution assumptions other than finite mean and finite variance, but you're going to get a gain over the single task averages if your means are close compared to the variances, okay. and depending on how much regularizer. So that's sort of a key result in terms of quantifying that. Um, but that result uh, only holds for two tasks. So it might hold for, well, there might be a generalization for more tasks, but we weren't able to get it. Um, but it does give you some indication of what we mean by statistically similar. I have one last question. I have to ask a question. I, uh, more abstractly, and looking at the, at the problem, I, I look at it more of a hierarchical mean estimate. Basically, you're, you're looking at the task and you're looking at the, uh, the population of the task. And then the, the, the question that comes up in my mind is so there is, therein lies a, a sort of a, an assumption then of the herbicity both within a, center, within a task and cross tasks. Is that, is that usually the case? Um, so I think this is a little dangerous because the James Stein estimation does does work with this hierarchical Bayesian interpretation, and you can think exactly like that about what's going on. Here, we're not making any assumptions like that, and we're not using any assumptions like that. We're just setting up this objective that says means should be close. And uh, as I said, if you try to take a Bayesian uh, viewpoint on that, it doesn't work as well as, uh, as you might like because the priors are improper. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so if you, if you try to take this regularizer, uh, you can write that with, with the Graf-Laplacian. Um, and you can think of it as coming from an improper gaussian markov random field. Um, and you do see these used for graphical models. But uh, I don't know. For, for me, that's not that helpful. Maybe we could talk later yeah, sure. if you have some more insights about that.
Let's thank our speaker again.